And now for some really serious action. Here's Oliver Twist. In a stagecoach, traveling with a mysterious companion. And by now you know who that is. Charles Dickens himself. They begin by discussing politics. And as the conversation ensues, there is a lot of excitement and accident ending in some really serious violence. Here's how it goes. I dare say you have heard tell of that quip betwixt Gladstone and Disraeli. Know you, sir, the dismal fate that doth await you, said the one to the other. The hangman's news are a sordid, iniquitous, disgraceful disease, said the other. That depends, sir, which I choose to embrace, your principles or your mistress. And he burst into an immoderate explosion of mirth that did occasion in me great discomfort. So depend upon it, sir, roared he, convulsed. My principles are authentically British, but my mistress is wisely French. This great ebullition of talk found no sounding chord in my heart, and I was casting about for a fitting repost when there went up a general cry of consternation and terror. A confused darkness, a commotion, a crash, a clatter, then a loud hallooing and hooting and howling, superadded to a dizzy motion, as though the celestial and terrestrial globes were by some frolicsome decree of their maker set wildly a jig in outer darkness. And at this juncture, I became sensible of myself, cast all of a heap upon my back, my limbs entangled intricately with those of my august companion. Purely inadvertent, I assure you, my dear sir, whispered he in my ear. Some mischance, queried I. Aye, quoth he, disentangling himself. A mischance, alas, to which all carts and coaches, Hansom, Landau's, Brougham's, Hackney coaches, barouches, curricles, gigs, phaetons, foreign hands, victorias and Brits cars, by the law of their species, are universally prone. It happens, sir, that our coach hath gone off the highway, its axles bent and broke, and is now a wallowing languidly in a ditch. And as he did launch upon that lengthy catalogue, I found him bestride my person, having extracted from the pocket of his astrakhan a vintage musket that had, it is exceedingly probable, rendered honourable service upon the fields of Waterloo. Pointing it at my hapless head, he did apostrophise me thus. I shall trouble you, sir, for that handsome Morocco bag I beheld upon your person. Be so good, sir, as to give it me. Oh, you know, deuce take it, this is an outrage, sir! expostulated I. I grant that my methods are open to reproach, said he blandly, but it happens that we are presently troubled by a fit of narrowness and reduced to penurious frugality. In short, narrow circumstances at home constrain me to resort to this extreme measure, and you who are acquainted with indigence in your difficult past will duly concede that life cannot subsist in society but by mutual concessions. So tarry not, sir, I prithee, your money or your life. Confound your impudence, quoth I. I'll be damned if I do. Tarry not, sir, else I shall be compelled to adjust this difference by pugilistic contest, abhorrent though it be to my peaceable soul. Have a care, sir, have a care, or you'll do yourself a mischief as sure as ever you were born. If man you be in heart, cried I, I do adjure you, let me rise. I bid defiance to you and that, that implement of defence. Do not question, sir, the wide range of my capacity for adventure, warned he in fearful tones. You threaten me with manslaughter, sir, demanded I. An accurate conjecture, rejoined he. I shall not have the least scruple in putting the intention into effect, and I strongly recommend that you bid farewell to the wherewithal. I shall accept the gift in the best humour possible, 
and it shall but prove the better for the happiness of all parties. Come, bestir yourself. Why the tardiness? At this crisis in my affairs, I partially recovered the use of my legs and essayed to extricate myself from the ignoble position wherein I was pinned when my amiable companion dug the butt of the weapon into my waistcoat, impairing all prospect of flight. An impolitic thought, smiled he, a task of which the labour shall not be repaid by the advantage, considering that you have not the contrivance to rise, nor the implement to assault. I would fain die, shouted I. Then it would be tedious to pursue this conversation. Recommend yourself, sir, to the protection of your Creator and Redeemer. In proof whereof, he raised the weapon to his shoulder, fitted and nerved his finger to the trigger, and it cast upon me an eye of menace. Stay! bleated I. There is no indispensable necessity of that! So was I led to produce from the recesses of my waistcoat pocket the desired object. Thank you, said my assailant, with the utmost cordiality. A heavy laden pouch, to be sure, observed he, weighing it reflectively. As Christians, sir, we should part with prayer, continued he, with sportive malignity. Come unto me, all ye that travel, and are heavy laden, and I shall give ye rest.